Red Dragon TV Cultural Center, 109 East Lakeside, Madison, Wisconsin. Good evening, everybody. I'm your host for the evening. Inagata DeVita is the name of our show. We do this every Friday night. And uh, tonight's guest is my very good friend, Yulia Myers. And she wrote a book called Coffee and Cake. Hold that up, honey. And uh, it's uh, an, ad- an adoptee in search of their past. What's the matter? Oh, it's not on over here. You could turn it on if you like. I know the TV's not on. It was? Well, goodness gracious. Is it coming through the broadcast, Marty? Yeah, it's coming through the broadcast. Okay. All right, well. I don't think it was. <laughs> Tech problems. Anyway, uh, our guest tonight is Yulia Myers. She wrote a book, uh, Coffee and Cake, and uh, it's an adoptee in search of her past is kind of the theme of the book. And well, welcome, Yulia. Thank you for coming to the show. Let's put this right up to you so that people can hear you talk because you're not a big, giant lion. So. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm yeah. glad to be here. Can you give her some more microphone? There. Okay. And um, let's see, uh, where are you from originally? Well, I'm originally from Germany. Uh, I was born there. Four. Four. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now <coughs> you can sh- should be okay. To go ahead and bring your mouth, like, right up in here. Oh. There That's new. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Well, I'm originally from Germany. That's where I was born. Mm -hmm. And I moved to the States when I was um, 29. Uh And um, what part of Germany are you from? I am from the beautiful Rhine Valley, Okay. kind of in the center of Germany. Okay, so um, the Rhine Valley is kind of in the center. (coughs) And um, growing up, was it very rural for you or very urban? Oh, well, I live in Oregon, Wisconsin now, and no, that's no, I, actually... I mean, in Germany. I know, oh, but okay. that's c- oh, I'm just sorry. my community where I grew up is okay. almost exactly like Oregon. Ah, that's why you like Oregon oh, so yes. much. It reminds me of Germany. Exactly. Because <laughs> ah, <laughs> okay. I, I used to live in Tucson for eight years, and when I came to Madison for the first time, I just fell in love with Madison. Yeah. Because Madison's part of it... Madison's because a it's weird town. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice town. Yeah, but it, I, what I mean by weird is that uh, there's an attitude here that you don't find elsewhere. That's true. <laughs> there's a little more acceptance here of people, and um, you know, if, if if you're a racist, you're a closeted racist <laughs> in mm-hmm. Madison, Wisconsin, because you're not going to get very far. Um, you're going to probably get clobbered by somebody. <laughs> but that's a good thing. Anyway, yeah. um, so growing up in Germany, uh, mm-hmm. it was a lot like Oregon, Wisconsin. Uh, were the people very similar to the people in Oregon, kind of laid back and, and Midwestern, the, the Midwestern <laughs> relaxed <laughs> attitudes? Huh. or? Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. that's most part of it. Yeah, that. yeah. Because I don't know much about Germany or the culture hmm. uh, that you come from, and I'm sure many of my viewers don't either. Um, Americans tend to think we're number one and <laughs> that nobody else exists. <laughs> and um, I'm trying to change that in my own world. But well, one thing in Germany is um, education really plays a high role. Ah. And Oregon and medicine, I guess, too. Yeah. It's Education is really important, and having little children, this was really important for me, and so Oregon is a great place. Yeah, and how old are your children? They're they're 9 and 11. Yeah, and uh, I must say, your children are growing up to be beautiful people. Well, thank you. They they really are. I've I've never met two such respectful individuals as your children are. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah, they're... That comes from you, honey. You know, <laughs> and, and, it, and it comes from your well, they raised too. No. You know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's some of both. But, yeah, oh, you know, yeah. you did a good job. You well, know? thank you. Yeah, yeah, you know, a lot of young people these days are, are very, um, can get nasty, <laughs> you know. And your children are not nasty. No, no, no. they're not nasty. Yeah, they're colorful, they're beautiful, they shine. 
you know when I, when you look at them they're they're happy kids yeah i, I have never say seen that. You, you, i wish you could meet her children because <laughs> these two kids can it can be the most boringest day on the planet and these two young people will find something to do to entertain each other <laughs> right yes. they're they're best friends but yeah, they're just they wouldn't good. admit to it oh, if yeah, you asked yeah, them but yeah. they are so um you came here when you were 29, right? Is that what you said? <laughs> you have to count. Okay, I'm not yeah. saying what year that was. Um, was I 29? I think so. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I don't know. Your, your 20s, anyway. You came to the States. In the late 20s, and, yeah. And <clears throat> how was that process for you? Um, to, to, from your initial time coming to the States, what was that process for you being a, transitioning to becoming a citizen? Because I know oh. now you are a citizen too. Yeah. You know, so talk a little bit about that if there were any difficulties involved with that. And well, not so much for me because I came as a student. Mm -hmm. So I had a student visa. Ah, okay. And uh, I was lucky that it was on basically unlimited, or it was for quite a long time. Uh -huh. And sometimes they can be limited, okay. and you cannot leave the co if you leave the country for a year, you can't come back. Uh, uh -huh. And I didn't have that in my visa. Now I don't know if it's F1 or J1. I had two different kinds uh, okay. because once I came before for doing research okay. for my master's degree. So when I came back, I had a visa for. Um, to go to college, to go to graduate school. Okay. So that was easy. And then I got married and I just changed the visa to, um, to a green card. Uh, okay. And that's, that, that's really funny. It is kind of like the movie, <laughs> I have to say. Oh, uh -huh. They ask you really funny questions. And being adopted, actually, that, that was very interesting because they ask Ross, um, my husband, about um, You have to use what this microphone oh, a little better. I have there to talk go. closer. Yeah. Um, they ask him about uh, what my mother's name was, if he ever met my mother, which he said, yes, my parents he met, and what was their names. And they looked at my birth certificate, and that uh. said my birth mother's name, but he had said my mother's name, who is my mother, is the one I grew up with. So that was different. So she looked at me, and I said, well, I'm adopted. And that is true, but he did meet my birth mother, too, so... Uh, uh -huh. That worked out, but and they ask really funny questions, even if you come already with children, which uh. we did. So, wow. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, was it a good experience for you to to, to come to, to go through the the process of becoming a citizen, or, or was it difficult? Oh well, that was the green card. Then mm -hmm. becoming a citizen for me was not really complicated actually, because I've been here now for fourteen years. Uh -huh. So, um, and you know, I, that, that, you know, and I speak the language well. There's a test you have to take. You I have struggle to with the, the immigration thing a lot <laughs> as, a, as a citizen. And, yeah. and where I struggle with is people who don't go through the process of getting a green card or becoming a citizen. I, yeah. I don't have a problem with immigration. What I want is documentation. Sim I mean... I don't exist in the United States without documentation as a citizen. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And um, I feel, you know, and it's not so much Europeans. It's a lot of um, Latinos and Mexicans who come from down south. And But, you know, the other but, problem I have with that mm -hmm. is they were here first. Before America was America, the, the Latinos from, from Mexico and down under, they, they traveled all over the Southwest, and they even, if, if memory serves me correct, California was a part of their statehood. So there's probably a, a deep-seated part of them that wants to go back to the lands that they immigrated M in. Maybe, but I, I think you have to think about it a little different. Okay. Because actually, <clears throat> I know several families who are illegal immigrants, mm -hmm. and I understand them much better now. And I, if you have a family, you want the best for your children. Mm -hmm. And if the country you come from, you know, that's different when you come from Germany. I mean, that was my choice to come mm -hmm. here. I mean, mm -hmm. but I love Germany still, and I could live there too, you know. Mm -hmm. It's not that I came because my home country... Um, had political issues mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. economic issues. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, but 
a lot of those people, they want the best for their families. And I can understand that. I mean, you want... I can understand that What happens much. a lot is, you know, many of those families, they do have social security numbers. They're faked or they're from people who died or mm-hmm. who don't live here anymore. But so they do produce things. You know, they have mortgages, they have mm-hmm. cars, they have jobs, they pay mm-hmm. social security, but they would never ask it back. Mm -hmm. So if they get unemployed, they don't ask for unemployment because they want to be as low. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they contribute to your economy, but they don't ask anything. I I understand that. I I, I, I do see what you're saying. Um, My take on the whole thing is, A, it needs to be easy for people to get green cards and to Mm -hmm. be legal status. Um, I, I don't think our nation should say, Yes to Germans and no to Mexicans. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. I, 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 I know that somebody in, in Dublin, Ireland can get a green card a lot quicker than someone in Mexico City. And something just dropped off here, Marty. What? Check one, one. No. All right. It's just the monitor going crazy over here. All right. Weird. Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, so but I do understand that. Um, however, I also know like in Texas, there are farmers who go out of their way to make sure that the employees who they hire from across the border become legal. Their HR services actually get them green cards. But there are other cases too. There, <clears throat> when we mm-hmm. lived in Tucson, I mean, there are lots of businesses who thrive Mm-hmm. on hiring just illegal immigrants mm-hmm. because they don't have to pay them very high. And that, that bothers me too, though, yeah. is, is that they can pay them. Exactly, because salary. they can use them, and that's yeah. not right either. Right. Mm-hmm. But what I wanted to say, you know, it's not that easy, actually, to get uh, a green card or a visa. When uh-huh. I was younger, I, I've been to America a lot since I was 16, uh-huh. and once I wanted to come for a year when I was uh in my early 20s, and I got rejected. Uh And I had an aunt here, an uncle, and cousins, and I wanted to stay there, but I was not allowed to come. Uh Uh So, I mean, it is not always granted Okay. just Uh because you're from Germany that you can come. Well, I wasn't saying that. I was saying it is easier. It's easier, yeah. Yeah, um, I'm not saying it's easy because, of course, there's probably a difficulty in any process with government, (laughs) no matter what that be, you know. So... um, also, but, but I, I just I feel very strongly that, you know, and I don't think it's right that people who work not get something back. You know yeah. what I mean? I think that that's an important aspect of community is that if you're paying in your taxes, you should get something back. Oh, know? yeah, I think and, so, too. And, you know, so there's that other aspect of and I know of, of groups in Chicago when I lived there who basically kept immigrants as slaves in their basement. Wow. <laughs> you know, while they worked in the restaurant during the day, at night they were told they had to stay downstairs and weren't allowed to go out on the town so they wouldn't get in trouble and get caught and things hmm. of that nature. So there's a lot of that that goes on. Let's go to a video and we'll come back. This boring life has got a hold on me anymore. I don't know where I'm going, don't know what I'm fighting for. Then you came. From the blue and darkening sky Then you rained upon me Then you filled me up with light And I can't tell you how we both got to this place But won't you ride beside me in my ordinary Extraordinary boring life Now if 
if I'd known this thunderstorm would roll on in. Would I have taken shelter or be caught outside again? Now here we stand Dancing in each other's arms And though the lightning crashes We both know we're safe from harm And I can't tell you how we both got to this place won't you ride beside me in my ordinary and extraordinary boring life? Take my hand Let the storm carry us away can walk alone And even when it's raining I will sing to you this song And we'll know just how we both got to this place You'll be right beside me in my ordinary Extraordinary boring life. Back on Inagata de Vida, I'm Ari John White Wolf with my friend Yulia Myers, author of the book Copy and Cake an adoptee in search of her past. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, your father being a citizen in immigration. Uh, you had just mentioned some things to me. Go ahead. Yeah, so my um, the interesting thing of my book is, too, that um, I was adopted as a baby, and my birth mother was German. But when I was 16, I realized that my birth father had been an American soldier. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, so technically, I was already part American, but um, when I met my birth father s- so seven years ago, I have mm-hmm. to think, <laughs> mm-hmm. it really didn't matter for me becoming a citizen that he was an American citizen. It was actually easier for me to just do it um, due to the fact that I had already lived here for 12 years and mm-hmm. not that he was American citizen. Yeah. Uh huh. So, so sometimes. That's so so not sometimes uh, <coughs> having an American si- uh, parental unit is probably not the best thing on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love my birth father, yeah, yeah, so yeah. it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, <laughs> as far as uh, citizenship is yeah. concerned, um, it sometimes doesn't and, and matter. I so and much. I and I say, you know. Uh, biological fatherly unit because you were an adopted person rather yeah. than calling him your father because that can get people confused a little uh, bit. Yeah, yeah. I say first father, yeah. <laughs> so um, I do understand how it <laughs> all works. <laughs> and, uh, you know, my mother was adopted. Oh, and, yeah? Yeah, and um, it messed with her terribly. Uh, oh, wh- why is that? She wasn't told she was adopted. Oh. And it didn't come out until she was about 14, and it came from a cousin Ooh. when the cousin was being mean. <gasps> yeah, and, that's... And as a result, she became an alcoholic and drug addict. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I, I heard stories like that a lot mm-hmm. during my life, and that's one thing I promote really a lot, and that's kind of why, why I wrote this book, too, is... Mm-hmm. Um, 
for me, adoption is a really, really great thing. And um, But one thing was my parents always, always told me and my brother, who was also adopted, that we were adopted from mm-hmm. babyhood on. I mean, we, were, we came to our parents when we were three months old. Mm-hmm. And um, the woman in the adoption agency told them that, um, as strange as it may sound, they should always tell us we're adopted. And even if they just change our diapers before we could talk, just say something like... Um, we're so grateful to your parents that they gave you for adoption because we wanted a child so bad and Mm -hmm. we couldn't have one and now we have you and Mm -hmm. things like that, you know, so Mm -hmm. to make it really normal and something special. And growing up, I thought that adoption was something Mm -hmm. really special. And see, my mother's generation, being adopted was a dirty thing. Mm. You didn't talk about that in our culture. Um, oh really? Yeah, mm-hmm. you you didn't talk about adoption. I mean, so giving somebody to, for adoption mm-hmm. was still bad when I was born. So my birth mother had issues all through her life and mm-hmm. still does because her husband a lot of guilt issues and, and yeah, guilt. And mm-hmm. her husband didn't want her to tell anybody who I really was when I came. Mm-hmm. I mean, he um, and he was a very nice guy, and I don't blame him at all. But he, you know, he thought growing up at his time, that um, it would cast a shadow on his wife if Mm. people would know that she had a daughter before she was married. Oh, right. And so he he was very nice, Mm -hmm. and and, uh, we did lots of things together, but he didn't want her to tell anybody who I really was. Interesting. That's an interesting angle to it that I would have never thought of. Yeah. So when they actually came to visit us in America, in Tucson, we used to live in Tucson still, and Mm -hmm. um, there I told everybody who they were. Mm -hmm. But when we visited them in Germany, he did not want anybody to know. So we just said we were friends from America. Mm -hmm. And the the sad part was that uh, my children are her grandchildren, her only grandchildren, Mm. and she could never tell. Wow. That's uh, pretty intense. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. that is. And, and, that, that and you know, uh, wow, to, to expect someone to think that way, that's, that's, a, that's a heavy burden, you know, to put on your mom, that she's never allowed to, yeah. s- to speak these things. And that, that was the only sad part in, mm-hmm. in this story, was for her that she could never really... Be open s- about be things. Be open, but, uh-huh. um, I mean, yeah. Sure. Uh-huh. Yeah, share, especially grandchildren, uh-huh. because that's really special to have grandchildren. Sure. And, I mean, my children, Carmen and Sean, they know who she is, and they know it's right. my birth mother. Sometimes they get a little confused, uh-huh. <laughs> because I have so many mothers and fathers uh-huh. <laughs> that they ask, that's your father? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Are you? Uh, Why do you think you call him grandfather? Queued up for break there? Yeah. Okay, we're going to go to break. And uh, come back with Yulia Myers. Spleens. The knave of spleens ate pork and beans all on a summer's day. The king of spleens ate nectarines to pass the time away. The knave of spleens had nectarines that uh, tasted sort of strange. Then the spleen king said, I'll see him dead. The knave is clearly deranged. Hence the folly of genetically altered fruit. Yo! 
You're watching Red Dragon TV, an internet station devoted to the finest in independent entertainment. We feature indie artists of all kinds from around the world. You can be part of the effort. Just click the donate button on the RDTV website and make a contribution to help keep Red Dragon TV on the air. You'll be helping to maintain a format to give exposure to all kinds of independent artists and to keep RDTV's fine programs going strong. Programs like In Agata De Vida, Escape to Music, The Wednesday Open Mic, Friday Night Variety Show, The Andina Rich Comedy Hour, and our 24-7 stream of music, poetry, novelty, and surprises. The big music corporations don't own show business anymore. Help keep it that way by supporting Red Dragon TV. Just click the donate button on the website and contribute whatever you can. And thank you for supporting independent entertainment on Red Dragon TV. You're watching Red Dragon TV. Yeah, I know. I'm a green dragon. I'm a temp. Deal with it. We just can't get good help at Red Dragon. It's always a green dragon, never a red <laughs> one. <laughs> I should make you one. <laughs> so, um, we were talking about your, um, your mother's husband, or probably stepfather, yes? Is that, how, how do we, what do we call him? In, in regards, <laughs> you know, because... That's it, difficult. It would be stepfather, yes? It, not really, because no? he's not really my father. Okay. He's, I, I just say my birth mother's husband. Well, in America, if if you were a, a child that pre-existed to a relationship, that becomes a stepfather. Yeah, but since I was adopted, I mean, legally, she's not my mother. Oh. Even so... Really? Yeah. Oh. And, oh, this was your your real mother, right? Wait, who? My, my who? birth mother's husband. Your okay. <laughs> ah, see, I it's even difficult. got confused. Okay, <laughs> so it was your birth mother's husband who yeah. didn't want you to say, and it, it didn't yeah. want her to say anything about my you. My parents were really open. But about your parents it. were all good. Yeah. Okay, now we so got. So if I talk away. about my parents, see, that's that's the important thing. I think if you're adopted, your parents are the ones who raise you. Those right. are your parents. Right. And, and I mean, for me, that's who they are. I mean, but I love my father. You saw how easy it was even for me to get confused oh, just sitting here. You know, and, and no, it's not you. It's just, yeah. it's hard for me even having two mothers and two fathers yeah. to co put all of that together. <laughs> <laughs> you know. See, I have six. So. Uh, okay. All right. <laughs> See, there's why it doesn't compute because I... <laughs> <laughs> I had a stepfather and a stepmother and yeah. a father and a mother. Oh, wow. Yeah, so. Um, <laughs> that's America. Well, yeah, that's America. <laughs> it's, it's the, that's the apple pie, isn't it? <laughs> but, um, okay, so we got that squared away. Now, you were, <laughs> you were also saying that um, your biologic, your birth mother's a uh, husband didn't want you to say anything and he didn't even know about this book no he coming didn't. out and then he passed away just before the book actually came out came yeah. to press okay yeah. mm -hmm. but i mean too since he lives in germany he wouldn't have known oh okay mm -hmm. all right yeah so let's talk about the book um yeah. coffee and cake uh, how how <laughs> long uh, of a process was it for you to write the book Probably three years, mm -hmm. but you know, I'm not a writer where uh, I sit down in the morning. Some authors do that, they have a schedule like mm -hmm. write six hours each day, mm -hmm. and I can't do that. Mm -hmm. I have to write when I'm in the mood. Mm -hmm. And it's one thing, you know, everybody, I never really planned to write this book, but um, mm -hmm. I was writing a dissertation, and that's pretty boring mm -hmm. <laughs> and so i needed some other outlet uh, and so people, it was kind of a hobby too yeah for you. people kept 
telling me that my story is so unique and that I should really share it with the world mm -hmm. and especially share it with families who have something to do with adoption, be it having adopted, being adopted, or having given up a child for adoption. Mm -hmm. And actually lots of feedback I get right now is from people, from mothers who have given children up for adoption. Mm -hmm. For them, it's a really, this book really gives them hope Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because you wonder, uh, my birth mother told me um, I was 28 when I met her and she had thought every single day of me, mm -hmm. every single day. And th she had three more daughters with her husband. Mm -hmm. And um, still, you know, every time they did something, they went to school for the first time, they had the birthday. Mm -hmm. She always thought, you know, what's with me? Mm -hmm. Was I happy? Was I healthy? And did I have siblings? Were you out of trouble? <laughs> uh, maybe. <laughs> yeah. No, it was always good. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> I was never good. <laughs> I was a bad little kid. <laughs> so you came. <laughs> oh, you don't know. <laughs> but anyway, um, writing this so. book was it an emotional process for you? Did you go have highs and lows as a result of writing it? You know, uh, Not so much. I think I was more surprised when I read it, when mm. I was done. Mm -hmm. um, because I realized, too, that the f it's kind of divided into two parts. And mm -hmm. the first half, um, you have to know my birth mother, when we met was just the time when I started moving to the U.S. So mm -hmm. I wasn't in Germany. So I met her once, and then I moved. So sh we kept writing letters because... Yeah, email. She doesn't have email, and so um, a letter takes about a week. Mm -hmm. So every two weeks there is a letter, and that was for that's fourteen years now. So you can count how many letters there are. Mm -hmm. So when I started writing this book, I used her letters because I kept them all. Ah. So I based all of this by the letters, and of course my sisters. You know, they sometimes I said, but it was different, and I said, yeah, that's possible, but. That's how I see it. That's how mm -hmm. I remember it. So it's mm -hmm. my view, but it's based on those letters. And then, mm -hmm. so I was rereading them and reliving the experiences, meeting my mother and what happened then. Do you want to do and a reading from something from your mother's letters? Um, well, then the, the letters aren't, those aren't in there. Uh, what, well, the letters or something which are from in that there. part of the book, I meant. Um, yeah, let's see. What can I read? Um, Again, hmm. you're listening to the author, uh, <laughs> no, Yulia Myers, <laughs> uh, with her book, Coffee and Cake. Um, and uh, it's an adoptee in search of her past. And my dear friend, Yulia, is uh, such a wonderful soul. I love her. And uh, I enjoy our little chats that we often get on Sundays <laughs> when we talk a lot. And um, yeah, go ahead and read what you would like to read. Well, what I just opened up was... Um, Make sure you use your microphone. Too. Yes. <laughs> well, that's, that's difficult. Whoops. Oh, I got it. oh it's okay. It's, that's not important. Um, maybe I can read from the chapter when I met my birth mother, and I called it Roller Coaster. It was, a, it was cold that morning of December 2nd. This day would be imprinted in my mind by two seemingly unrelated events, which would through their power of synchronicity, ultimately be inseparable. I know this does not make sense at this moment, but the notion of yin and yang wouldn't become meaningful for the would become meaningful for the first time in my life. I woke up early that day and was nervous and excited at the same time. What would happen? Today I would meet Edda, my birth mother, for the first time. What would I say? Would we cry? Would she like me? Question after question, none of which I could answer. This day would almost certainly change my life forever. I just did not know yet in what fundamental ways. I even briefly considered not going to meet her at all, <laughs> to just pretend I had never written the letter. But it had been my choice, my decision, and now I had to face the consequences. And maybe I can add here, when I wrote the letter, to her, because I initiated the contact. 
I knew at that moment that I would change my and her life forever. And so you have to be really careful what you say and what you do at this first meeting and this first letter because this can change people's life forever. And, and it could and really hurt you. you ha you're very vulnerable at that point. Yeah, exactly. And you really don't know, as I said. I mean, I didn't know would she like me or li would I like her, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So... Um, oh yes, I wanted to meet her, to get to know her, but at the same time I was afraid. This is different than meeting just anybody. This meeting had the potential to change my life forever. Not that I would really change, but my feelings, the image I had of myself would be altered. I would meet the woman who had given birth to me, the woman who decided my life was more important than hers, and that I should have a family, even if it meant she would never see me again, her own flesh and blood. I admired my parents. They did not seem nervous at all. They knew I was not meeting her to find a new family. They knew my loyalty was with them. When they got married, my parents had plans for a big family, but things went differently. They were unable to get pregnant, and after four years of trying and many doctor visits, they finally realized that if they wanted to have children, they needed to adopt them. At that time, parents had to be a certain age to legally adopt children. My mother, at 28 years of age, was considered too young. However, my father, being 14 years older than my mother, was the right age. After a lot of consulting, they were allowed to foster and later adopt a child. Maybe I jump forward now. Now it comes about my birth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the birth year, I'm not saying that. Um, let's see. Then, and then 28 years later, I was about to meet my birth mother. After a very light breakfast, I could barely get anything down, and a shower, I was ready. But I still had a few hours until I had to leave. It was difficult to concentrate or do anything. I sat in my room meditating about what lay ahead. When it was lunchtime, and so I had barely eaten breakfast, I could not get anything down. I was too nervous. Finally, it was time for me to leave. I took my parents' car, a small red Mazda sports version. Also, I knew the way. I was terrified. I would not find the town or the train station. I arrived much too early, of course. I stood there, dressed in my black wool coat and a bright red poncho salteño over my shoulders. I bought this poncho in Argentina and loved its color. I wore it all the time and it looked great over my black coat, especially because the poncho had two black vertical stripes on one side over the shoulder. I told Edda on the phone that I would wear this poncho so she could recognize me. Um, I checked the train schedule and went to the appropriate platform. It was quite cold, but I was sweating. I had to wait about 15 minutes. Then the signal turned green and I could see the train slowly coming into the station. I was so nervous. The train arrived at the station and I tried to look through the pa passing doors to see her. A woman was standing behind one of the doors. Then the train came to a halt. The door opened and a woman who could only be Edda stepped down the two steps onto the platform. Because no one else exited the train, I knew it had to be her. I walked towards the 56-year-old woman with gray curly hair trying to smile and trying not to cry. I was somewhat, it was somewhat awkward, but somehow we managed to hug each other. Almost 30 years of wandering, regretting, feeling guilty, feeling a loss and being endlessly grateful were poured into this first self-conscious yet wonderful hug. Then we both cried. We quickly tried to pull ourselves together. After all, we had not really met yet, if you do not consider the birthing room at the hospital, mm -hmm. <laughs> and did not want the other to feel uneasy or embarrassed. Edda and I were almost exactly the same height, except I was about one inch taller. I also found some similarities in our eyes, but other than that, it was really hard to tell on the first impression. We important. Very importantly, though, she seemed to be a very kind and loving person, and that was something for which I could not have wished. Um, well, then this chapter talks more about what we did. Mm -hmm. And it was a really interesting meeting, because <laughs> when you grew up being adopted, you know, nobody looks like you. Mm -hmm. All 
what you are, what you do, you're, that I do this all the time, for mm -hmm. example, you know, that's just me. Nobody else in my family does this. Mm -hmm. But then when you meet your birth families, especially both of them, mm -hmm. like I did, suddenly everybody claims you. Like my hair, my hair is my father's, my eyes are my mother's, mm -hmm. my feet, apparently my aunt's, <laughs> <laughs> and my movements, my father's, and so on. And then both families claim the same things. Mm -hmm. I don't know how that can be, but, <laughs> you know, so my, my biggest trouble in the beginning was that I was afraid I would lose my identity ah, mm -hmm. because, you know, who I was was just me. When my parents, my brother and my cousin is adopted as well, and by the way, lives in Oregon too. Mm -hmm. um, when we grew up and our parents did something we didn't agree on or with, then we would just say, you yeah, know, thank goodness we're adopted, so oh. we won't be like this when we grow up. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and you could do it both ways, but uh -huh. if, you know, other people say, oh, you just look like, like your mother, uh -huh. then we, you know, we'll be happy because, and I still do that with my mother my adoptive mother, my, mm -hmm. my real mother, when, you know, we're the same height, we like the same clothes, and, mm -hmm. you know, we just say, oh, I have that from you. Mm -hmm. and, and it's nice, because it's, we say that because we love each other, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, but yeah, if you suddenly find your birth families, everything gets claimed by somebody else. Mm -hmm. Nothing seems to be yours anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's really difficult. Now, when when you reached out to your birth mother and you had that initial meeting with her, tell me about the trepidations through the process of before you met her. Um, you had some reservations, and I, I remember you vaguely. I, I can't remember if it was either you had received a letter and you wouldn't open it right away or <laughs> you, or you were going to send a letter and you didn't i don't remember how that went with. yeah it's it's very scary i mean when i wrote the letter i i wrote the letter i wrote to her was seven pages long handwritten and it took me seven months to write it mm -hmm. and it even just the title took me forever because I didn't know, should I say Dear Edda, which is her name, mm -hmm. or Dear Mother? Mm -hmm. Because what I do, I knew that if I say Dear Mother, then it's established. and mm -hmm. But that might be conflict with my mother. Mm -hmm. and, and that is my mother. And I wanted to make it clear that even so, she is my birth mother. Your real mother. My real mother existed. is there too. Mm -hmm. I have a mother. Mm -hmm. So it's not that I'm looking for another mother. I'm looking for who I am. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I wanted to tell her I'm fine because I was So told how long did it take you to actually contact her then? Oh, well, from the day I decided to do it until I finished the letter was seven months. Uh -huh. And then it took me a little bit to find her because it was a closed adoption and it was not really legal to find her. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I did some tricks. Okay. So I'm not all good. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I found her pretty easily, actually. And then, yeah, then happened what you said. I went, we, in Germany, see, our mailboxes, you can't put a letter in and tell the mailman to get it. You have to walk to, to a public, or a public mailbox. Ah, They're uh -huh. yellow mailboxes, all okay. like maybe two, three in town. Mm -hmm. So you walk there, Germans walk a lot. Mm -hmm. So you walk to the mailbox and you put it in. And that's what I did. I walked to the mailbox, I put it in, and then I didn't know what to do. And I, I actually got sick. I mean, I got sick to my stomach, mm -hmm. and I was so scared. So I stood next to the mailbox for quite a while, mm -hmm. thinking that I should wait for the mailman who comes twice a day and, and ask for the letter back. <laughs> <laughs> but then I finally left, too. It was cold. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it was very scary to do. Mm -hmm. And with my birth father, it was the same thing. Mm -hmm. I sent the letter after having it lying there for like two months. Mm -hmm. And then I finally sent it. And when I got his answer, I didn't even read it yet, but just receiving his answer, because with him, I wasn't so sure if he really wanted me because he had disappeared when I was, you know, before I was born. So I wasn't mm -hmm. sure, does he really want to acknowledge I exist? Mm -hmm. And, but when his answer, his letter came, so before I even saw it, I cried, I cried for about an hour mm -hmm. and I could not stop and I didn't 
it it caught me so off guard because I thought, yeah, you know, if he if he accepts me, fine. If not, well, that's fine too. I I don't mind. You know, mm-hmm. that's his life, and I'm happy. So, but to get a letter was so emotional, and I had no idea. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You didn't see that coming at all. No, not at all. And you know, <laughs> during this whole process, you didn't really have anyone to guide you you kind of just stumbled along right yeah Yeah. i didn't know anybody who had done this Mm -hmm. i mean i knew lots of people who are adopted Mm -hmm. including my brother and my cousin but i and i knew lots of people who wanted to find their birth parents but i had never actually met anybody until then who had done it Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i have a friend who just adopted a baby um, they're not they're in the process i guess the adoption process takes quite a while, mm-hmm. um, but it um, <laughs> he says funny things on Facebook. Uh, two days ago, it was "arg nappy blowout at armpit level," <laughs> <laughs> and, and basically over there, a nappy is is a diaper, and he has a, <laughs> a diaper issue that went all over his shirt. And you know, yeah. the, the upside of being a parent uh, when you take on a baby is uh, there's some not so pretty aspects. <laughs> involved but um the the fun thing he writes is is i can tell how much he loves this baby you know um it's quite apparent that he's always there for this child yeah and and that's what my mother always told me was when you get a baby put in your arms that Mm -hmm. is your baby no Mm -hmm. matter where it comes from Mm -hmm. and it'll always stay and i mean my mother is the best mother ever and she's Mm -hmm. still treats me like a baby sometimes uh-huh, uh-huh. i mean she's very overly protective uh-huh, uh-huh. Still. and let's talk about that overly mm-hmm. protective how what did she what was her take on you reaching out to your biological hmm. parents how did, how did she feel about that? that that's a very interesting story because she uh, see when actually hold that thought okay. we're going to play a video and come back to this question okay okay From Madison, Wisconsin, this is Sexy Esther. Name of the song is uh, Glitter Baby.
was Glitter Baby by Sexy Esther. And if you don't know Sexy Esther, look them up on YouTube and Facebook. Uh, great kids. They're good kids. They are from Madison. And uh, they won a Mama's Award. Are you familiar with the Mama's? Madison <laughs> Area Musical Association. Um, it's kind of like the, the Grammy Awards, but in Madison. Wow. And um, what they do is they raise all kinds of money uh, from this project. It costs everybody who votes five dollars per vote for all these different categories, and then the money that they raise, they uh, put instruments in the kids' hands oh, so wow. they can play music. And uh, all the area schools, that's where all of their music departments get most of their help from. So, wow! Yeah, that's pretty wonderful. cool. Yeah, it is wonderful because. You said education in Germany is very important, and I, I'm sad to say in, in the States, I don't see education as a priority. You know, I, I think it's stress that it you should get depends education. Depends where you are. Yeah, um, but and what, I mean from a government <laughs> level. Yeah. Um, they, they really don't care so much about making sure that the arts exist or that uh, sports programs exist or things of that nature. They, and then even some of the academics, they just rather some of that didn't exist either, which is really sad, you know, because um, education should be the first thing that we dump money into rather than the yes. last thing, <laughs> you know, and uh, those teachers need to get paid, folks. So, yes. uh, you know, if, if you've got a child, um, that child's teachers are probably the most important people besides you in their lives and they should be paid accordingly, as far as I'm concerned. Um, the tremendous levels of self-control and discipline that a teacher has to have, yeah. you know, when children are cutting up, and uh, it's a job I couldn't do. It would make me nuts. <laughs> you <know? laughs> and, and you are a teacher, in a sense, you, you, well, at Unity of Madison. You, yes. You are in charge of the Sunday school program. And, yes, I am. Uh, that's a really cool thing that you do uh, for the young kids. And, uh, and you I really have a passion <laughs> for young people. Oh, I do. And I sub with the mm -hmm. Oregon School District. So today oh, I actually uh -huh. worked. So when Brooklyn. you sub at the Oregon School District, is that uh, all academic classes? No, that's a uh, special education sub ah, I do. Okay. And I love that. I love uh -huh. to work with those children. Wonderful. Yeah. And it's really fun. Cool. And I love all the teachers and the schools. Uh-huh. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and all the children. Uh-huh. So let's go back to the story <laughs> that we were going to talk about with um, your, your, um, your, real, your mother mm -hmm. versus your biological mother and your biological father. It, it, when you went to meet those people... How did your mother feel about that process? How did, what, what were her warnings or trepidations towards that? Actually, um, at that time, my father was still alive, too. And my parents, I asked my parents if they would mind if I contacted my birth mother at that point, because mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about my birth father, really. And they didn't. They, you know, but I was not a child anymore, mm -hmm. so they knew that I was not looking for another family, for another father or another mm -hmm. mother, mm -hmm. that I was just really curious, and too, that I wanted to show Etta that I was fine and, you know, give her some ease, because mm -hmm. I could imagine that... Um, she was impact. worried because, yeah. too, you know, I knew from my parents that when I was little, when I was a baby, until I was about six, she had written letters to the adoption agency asking how I was doing. And uh, it was anonymous, so they would send the letters then to my parents, uh -huh. and they would answer and send them to the agency, and they would give them to my birth mother until... Uh, they told my birth mother she should not do that anymore because she would remind my parents all the time that I was adopted. Uh, uh -huh. But my parents didn't know that they did that. Okay. So, so I knew she had interest in my life, and mm -hmm. so I thought it would be good for me, it would be time um, to tell her that I was fine and that I thought she did a great thing. And in a sense, it's almost like coming full circle. You yeah, know, you know, well... Yeah, that that yeah. that actually <laughs> the full circle comes later. But oh, okay. um, yeah, so my parents didn't mind at uh -huh. all. And but I'm sure your mother, being a protective woman, she had concerns that she, she wanted to share with you. 
in, in, in this process? She, she, not so much actually at that okay. time. She just wanted me to be happy and okay. safe, and she was not worried um, mm -hmm. from what she knew about Edda that that I was so in she any didn't way think in danger. It would be hurt or anything no, like that. Okay. she didn't think okay. that. L later on, she did when I. Um, after I met my birth fa mother, my, my father died. And then it got a little complicated. Uh -huh. um, but so when I found my birth father, then my mother was a little upset because um, she was a little more concerned with him because she didn't know anything about him because I lived in America. So she wasn't close mm -hmm. to help. Mm -hmm. And uh, also she was a little more jealous because my father wasn't there anymore. And she thought that my birth father, Adi, uh, was too close to me. Oh. <laughs> Even so he lived in Kentucky, he still does. And I lived in Arizona at the time. Uh -huh. For her, that was close because compared to Germany, sure. that's close. But so there here she Here it's a almost little like living in Europe from <laughs> one country to another, yes. Yeah, so <laughs> exactly. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, that's poor. the distance. That would be like going to Russia. Uh -huh. But um, so that was a little more difficult for her because she was so far away and she yeah. couldn't help. She, she wasn't there. Uh -huh. And uh, it got much better when uh, when we moved here and uh, my mother comes every two years and the other year we go uh -huh. there and so that first year she came to visit us in Oregon uh, my birth father came to see her ah. so he and his wife and uh, came to visit uh, me and my mother and How my aunt go? actually <laughs> oh that was <laughs> that that was that was very emotional that uh -huh. was much more emotional than i thought uh -huh. because uh he, <laughs> it's very strange to hear people talk about you uh -huh. because that's what they did you know yeah. they they my birth father told her which i thought was really nice you know what a great job she mm -hmm. did in raising me and who I became and she told him how grateful she was mm -hmm. that basically he created me because that's how she got me and then they were give, you know telling each other what a great person I was mm -hmm. <laughs> and I felt kind of embarrassed like a third person yeah so I actually left yeah. the room at some point and and it, it was really emotional for uh -huh. me. Uh -huh. It was much more emotional, I think, uh -huh. <laughs> than for them. Uh -huh. Well, sure, you um, were connecting a lot of dots, and and they yeah. really they really liked each other. And after that, she was just fine. And now she is so happy that he's here because uh -huh. if I ever get in trouble, he would jump in his car and come or uh -huh. send my brothers, who I have lots of. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And uh, so. I, you know, now I have the family here mm -hmm. I didn't have before. Now, did he know you existed? Did, was <laughs> he, did he know that, well, that your biological mother had a, a daughter? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He Well, he didn't know I was a girl, but he did know. Well, see, that's the military. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and if that chaplain is watching, or any time, <laughs> uh -huh. I want to say something. No, it's... Uh, what, what happened was he was really young. He was 18 uh -huh. and um, a minor in the military, you know, going to Germany. And that was in the, I think, in the 60s. Uh -huh. So, um, you know, they told the soldiers that they should not date German women because all German women wanted was to become Americans. Oh. Because apparently that's so important. Oh. So, um, uh, so, you know, he did date my birth mother. I mean, you know, they, they had passes to leave uh -huh. twice a month or something. So... Um, and when she got pregnant, she told him, and he was all excited, and both told me that, and he wanted, apparently he wanted a boy, but uh, then he went to his uh, superior, and um, actually, I could read you the letter, sure. because ahead. he, what he did, when my birth mother came to visit here, he sent her uh, he wanted to meet her too, but she wasn't ready yet, and that's where the circle closes. I uh -huh. think is did if we, did we miss break? Uh, pretty much right now, but all right. Why don't we go to break and then we'll come back to Sorry. what she's gonna read? <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> if 
found it. And now, the Tea Party Education Moment. R is for Buffalo. This has been a Tea Party Educational Moment. Red Dragon TV, an internet station devoted to the finest in independent entertainment. We feature indie artists of all kinds from around the world. You can be part of the effort. Just click the donate button on the RDTV website and make a contribution to help keep Red Dragon TV on the air. You'll be helping to maintain a format to give exposure to all kinds of independent artists and to keep RDTV's fine programs going strong. Programs like In Agata De Vida, Escape to Music, The Wednesday Open Mic, Friday Night Variety Show, The Andina Rich Comedy Hour, and our 24-7 stream of music, poetry, novelty, and surprises. The big music corporations don't own show business anymore. Help keep it that way by supporting Red Dragon TV. Just click the donate button on the website and contribute whatever you can. And thank you for supporting independent entertainment on Red Dragon TV.
watching Red Dragon TV. Yeah, I know. I'm a green dragon. I'm a temp. Deal with it. And we're back on Inagata de Vida at the Red Dragon Cultural Center, 109 East Lakeside, Madison, Wisconsin, USA. What do you think of this crazy stuff that I got going on here? <laughs> it's very good. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what you're going to read next uh, um, so people know what's coming. Yeah. So <clears throat> what I wanted to read you to you was um, the letter my birth father wrote to my birth mother when she came to visit because you have to think my birth mother doesn't really speak English so well. Mm -hmm. And uh, she came to visit me here in um, Wisconsin, and my birth father actually wanted to come and see her and mm -hmm. explain, but she didn't want that yet. She's not ready yet, but I hope the next time mm -hmm. she comes to visit. And so at least he wrote her a letter, which then I read to her and translated into German. Mm -hmm. And um, because I was talking about if he knew that I existed or not. Mm -hmm. And so I thought it's better I read this letter because he explains it in his own words. Mm -hmm. So the letter says, Dear Edda, I have spent the last year and a half trying to find the right words to explain to you what happened almost 40 years ago. Then I realized there are no words to express my emotions about finding out we share a daughter. My heart is happy because of Julia and how well her life has turned out, but heavy with sadness because of what you must have endured having to make such a difficult choice in your life. I can try to explain what happened and hope it might give you some peace. I am truly regretful for any and all the pain I unknowingly put you through and hope you can find it in your heart to forgive me. <clears throat> it's been a long time ago and I remember how happy we both were when you told me we were going to have a child. I asked my commanding officer for permission to marry and was told I had to ask the army chaplain and several others in order to get permission. After weeks of talk and requests, I was denied permission and was no longer allowed off base. See, that's what the military did. Mm. I was angry and asked to be discharged, but at 18 years of age, it too was denied. The next thing I knew, I was being shipped back stateside without a chance to talk to you. I was being... Oh. I was told many lies, and I believed each and every one, but even so, I should have been stronger. I can understand if you can't forgive me, but I only hope you can try to understand if possible. You have nothing to be ashamed of, and you were very brave to do what you did. I'm sorry I was not as strong as you. Julia has given you and me two beautiful grandchildren, and we can be so proud of everything she has accomplished. She has your strength and courage. God works in ways that are sometimes hard to understand, but I believe he had angels caring and watching over Julia and her adoptive parents. They have given Julia so many things you and I may, have, may not have been able to. Most of all, they loved her and gave her a wonderful childhood. Julia has touched so many lives, and I am sure each person is better off because of her. I know I am. I can remember a special time in my life when I was young and strong and the world was beautiful and exciting and you, Edda, were part of my life. You will always be a part of my life and Julia is a reminder of that time. May God always bless you and keep you safe from harm. Sincerely, Adi Garrett. Hmm. So, um, oh, that's tough. You know, he wasn't allowed. Yeah. To know you, he was denied that access. Mm -hmm. And um, let's talk a little bit about the process of, of getting in touch with him. <laughs> how, how did that go? That, <laughs> as I said before, that was very emotional mm -hmm. for me, unexpectedly, because I wasn't so sure. Um, because that part, of course, I didn't know. Mm -hmm. I just knew there was a woman who got pregnant and he disappeared but you know i was i was old enough to be open to possibilities and when um edda had given me a picture of him she had kept a picture of him for me you know and i saw this 18 year old soldier i thought my god you know he's a child how mm -hmm. you know how can i being 
you know, in my mid thirties, be angry of somebody who's eighteen. I mean, it's you tough. Know, so it's tough to lay and blame on an eighteen year old. Yeah, <laughs> you can't really. And too, you know, I I had a wonderful life, mm -hmm. so I can't really blame him for anything. And we all mature differently. I mean, uh, for a lot of men, it takes <laughs> us to about thirty years old to to mature into adulthood. Um, that's that's scientific knowledge that that men grow up slower than women do, and you know, it, yeah, that's that's a tough challenge. Where where you know where do you stand on that issue? You know, I, did he love me? Did he care about me? Did he even know I existed? Mm -hmm. You must have had a million questions going through your head all the time. I did, and mm -hmm. uh, he. So I wrote him a letter too. Mm -hmm. Not quite as emotional as the letter I had written to Edda, and they're mm -hmm. all in my book. Now, how long did that process take you? That was actually really funny because my sisters, two of my sisters from Germany, so my half sisters, my birth mother's daughters, mm -hmm. were there, and we were writing the letter together because they wanted to know who he was. Oh wow! And my birth mother didn't know I was doing that. Ah. <laughs> she didn't want to so much so we did it anyways and they helped me <laughs> so that that was kind of funny to do and um but then I was too I was afraid of sending it so it, I waited uh -huh. and then my mom came to visit and I told her about it and then I sent it and then it took a long time for an answer to arrive and that was really strange but our number telephone number is unlisted Mm -hmm. And uh, he wanted to call. That's his thing. He he likes to call. Um, but so he he did write a letter, but he couldn't read my n numbers very well. So uh -huh. it went to a wrong address and came back. And then he resend it. And that's why it took so long. And uh, the letter was very nice, but short. Mm -hmm. And he just wanted to talk. And. Uh, on the phone so it gave me I, I'm a person I need a night to sleep over things so mm -hmm. um, it gave me my night and then the next day I called him when I was ready mm -hmm. and then we talked for two hours and he wanted to immediately jump in his car and come and visit and meet me and that that's too much that too <laughs> so, like no 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 N not now Let, let's give me some time he said can mm -hmm. I call you every day like, I don't know what to say every day. Can we make it like, maybe once or twice a week? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, we talked on the phone quite often mm -hmm. for two months, and then finally and I let him come. And to some extent, that's probably a better <laughs> way of doing it. Because yeah. Because you got to know to, him a little bit before you got to know him. <laughs> yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. But mm -hmm. um, he, he is a wonderful person, and mm -hmm. you just got to love him. Well, you so. know... <clears throat> Germans are probably slower to jumping into the frying <laughs> pan like Americans are. We tend to do yeah. things really fast in America. And dating, you, two weeks, you're this is the one for the rest of my life mm -hmm. in, yeah, and in America. And uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, he he wanted to do the typical American thing. He wanted to run and meet you right away. And you probably were doing the typical German thing, a little reservation. Let's wait and take it a little <laughs> slow. And it's interesting to see the two cultures the two. coming together, you know? And, yeah. Uh -huh. um, and go yeah, ahead, go yeah. Ahead. so he, he did come and he brought his wife mm -hmm. and um, was a wonderful, wonderful person. Mm -hmm. um, Irene Garrett, Ruth Irene Garrett. And mm -hmm. uh, actually she uh, is Amish. And she got shunned when she married him. Oh, wow. And so she wrote books about that, about growing up Amish and being shunned. And mm -hmm. she's a best-selling author. Nice. And um, make, maybe she can come. Uh-huh. That would be Next awesome Next time she to comes to visit. Because, yeah, yeah she's a great her. person. Tell her that uh, she should come on the program because it's yeah. all about everyone. Red Dragon TV isn't about me. It's about people like you. Yeah, and it's important that so, I bring people on who have a message to share. Yeah, and she mm -hmm. does, and mm -hmm. and yeah, she's wonderful, and the kids mm -hmm. just absolutely love her, mm -hmm. and Audie too. But she's <laughs> mm -hmm. she's a great person, and and so is he. And he brought one of my brothers. Um, he has six more children, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, and Monty, he. Um, 
we get a really nice relationship. Mm -hmm. And so um, Monty stayed with us and um, Adi and Irene stayed in a hotel. That was nice too because it's not, you know, there's this person who you don't know but you're supposed to be close. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a really difficult thing. You know, Mm -hmm. how you you try to be more open and... uh, get to know that person on a different level right mm-hmm. away because you have a different basis. You and know? you feel obligated to some extent. Kind of, mm-hmm. yeah. There's, there's a weird energy within you that says, I've got to see this through to see what this is going to take me on. What yeah. journey is this going to take me to? But even though it's a scary journey, <laughs> you had to take it. Yeah. You, you, in, some, in, in some respects, you, you really had a lot of doors open for you to step through and, and that could be a scary journey. Uh, you know, what if it's completely all yeah, of my worst fears. <laughs> but, you know, I was I was really, really lucky because both my birth parents are so open and mm-hmm. so welcoming and so loving and, um, you know, accepting of the mm-hmm. fact, too, that I do have another family, that mm-hmm. I do have a brother, that I do have parents, and yeah, that I grew up in Germany. So mm-hmm. between my American family, birth family, and me, is a big difference. So let's talk think. about your. Um, uh, w- actually, we'll, we'll go to video and we'll come back in a moment. Alright. Uh. Sisters taught her well, but her tongue was trickery and cursed to be heard. As an echo, she lost the voice beautiful and sweet. Now what does a girl do but sit there to weep? She just sits there. artist I is not and uh, I think he's from 
out west is where I think he's from. But we're with Julia Myers here at Red Dragon uh, Cultural Center, Madison, Wisconsin, USA. That's where we're at. And um, uh, uh, Julia, Julia was asking, uh, how can people watch this? Well, we're going to have it on our YouTube archive page. Uh, Red Dragon Video is the name of the username on YouTube. And you can find out all kinds of past shows that are on there. And um, you want to read something else from your book? No, no, I'm put on the spot. <laughs> hmm, let's see. How about an area that you, you feel is important that you haven't covered yet? Hmm. You should have told me that before. No, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, now I'm... Mm. <laughs> well, let, let's talk about your yeah, sisters. Um, oh. Your... Um, How, during this process, how, how, how did the, were they, I mean, were what? they protective? Were they angered? Were they jealous? <laughs> what, what, what emotions were they feeling? Okay, that, there, that is a topic that's difficult um, with my siblings and, and my birth parents and my parents too, mm -hmm. is, you know, this, this book is how I perceive things. Mm -hmm. And uh, I realize, you know, when I... Uh, when I'm in an interview like this, mm -hmm. you know, it's hard. I don't want to to hurt anybody or put also right. put nobody out who doesn't want to be out. All oh, right. You know, mm -hmm. so that's a little difficult. But I can tell you in general, it is, I mean, it is fun to, I grew up with one brother who is, by the way, a wonderful, wonderful mm -hmm. brother. Mm -hmm. um, we email each other every mm -hmm. day. But... Um, to it, and to have ten siblings now uh -huh. is is really an experience, and there there is a difference. In the beginning, my sisters, I have three sisters, half sisters in Germany, mm -hmm. and when I um, met them the first time, I met them one at, after the other because mm -hmm. of their father was um, he didn't know that I met them, mm -hmm. and and it was a secret. So I met the oldest one first. And that was really nice. I mean, we got along so well, but we made a mistake, and I realized that later on. Mm -hmm. um, it was a well-meant mistake. As uh, When we met, um, we thought, as, as you realize, it's really complicated to say, okay, my brother, my half-sister, mm -hmm. my birth mother, my adoptive mother. I'm, mm -hmm. It's so complicated, and people get confused. And mm -hmm. so I thought, well, I just have a brother and three sisters, and then later, you know, more. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't work that way because there is a difference because the the brother I grew up with or the siblings you mm. grew up with, you have a very different relationship you because we, mm -hmm. yeah, and you know them from childhood on. I mean, mm -hmm. from, you know, you know everything, everything about your brother. Yeah. Then, yeah. While um, my other si siblings, you know, you, you get to know them. Mm -hmm. It's a little different than meeting friends mm -hmm. um, because you you open a little more. You want them to know you, and you want to have a relationship. I mean, I always do. I love to have ten siblings. You mm -hmm. know, that's a wonderful thing. But yeah, we didn't grow up, so mm -hmm. you put in this shoe where you 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 meet somebody, and but all our childhoods were already over. I mean, I mm -hmm. have siblings who are twenty years younger than me. My youngest sister is twenty years younger. She's in Kentucky mm -hmm. or in Indiana now and um, one of my brothers is 19 years younger than me and he said once <laughs> very sweet he he said well you know I'm really sad we didn't grow up together mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was laughing I said well Matthew I'm 19 years older than you we would have never grown up, grown up together you know I'm mm -hmm. too old <laughs> mm -hmm. even if we were full siblings and we would have lived in the same country all our lives we mm -hmm. would have never grown I mean he, mm -hmm. he could be oh, my, my child in yeah, a right. way you know uh -huh. from the age mm -hmm. but I thought it was really sweet that he said that because I know why he said it you mm -hmm. know it's it's too bad I mean we we try to to get this time we missed mm -hmm. um, but it's difficult and mm -hmm. and there are th issues you know like my sister's um, when I met them, I, I was really sad that, you know, I was thinking they had a really good relationship with each other. And I, I was a little jealous thinking, you, you know, they could 
they can go shopping on Saturdays. They always went shopping together. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I thought, wow, wouldn't that be nice to have a sister who you can go close shopping with on mm-hmm. Saturday mornings? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that, that was a nice image, and I wanted to have that. Mm-hmm. But I couldn't, really, because... The three of them, they were together. That's what they did. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, and now I lived in the U.S. Mm-hmm. So they came to visit um, and we tried to, you know, get to know each other. But it's difficult, yeah, because you don't. I mean, there is so much you don't know about each mm-hmm. other because you didn't grow up. Mm-hmm. And so when I met my siblings in Kentucky, I did it a little differently, um, a little more reserved in a way but Mm -hmm. um you know i tried not to 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 get too too involved and to pretend yeah to let it more happen and and that that was much better Mm -hmm. and i actually with monty my one brother in indiana i have such a great relationship Mm -hmm. and it's not so with your sisters, it's you kind of forced that relationship. Y- y- a little yeah, bit. I mean, we all did, mm-hmm. and then then things happened, like, you know, mm-hmm. because we weren't ready yet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It was too fast, right. too too fast, and, and, I, and think, I, I mean, going that's back my to, interpretation. to your um, to your uh, unfolding relationship with your father, um, I look at a lot of relationships sexually speaking in in the states and and people tend to take them just way too fast you know um they tend to to have sex before the relationship (laughs) you know that that's an american thing and um then they get into trouble because they haven't worked out all the issues early on in the relationship you know what i mean the the different stages um uh in a relationship probably the first stage is you're holding hands and the second <laughs> stage is you kiss and you know things of that nature and americans we tend to overdo everything right away mm. <laughs> you know, we're, we're 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 big texans so to speak <laughs> you know well, it depends on the yeah, age too, yeah yeah think, that's you know. that's true that's true but um when you were establishing your relationship with your father you did it over the phone and and built it slowly before you actually met in person and you built that relationship that and too that sounds like a very positive healthy process it was the other the other very healthy part was that my birth father he told everybody that i was his daughter mm. and he told everybody that he was young and inexperienced and that he had done some mistakes, mm-hmm. but I was the wonderful result of that. Mm-hmm. And he wanted to show the world that I existed. Mm-hmm. So he bought us tickets to fly to Kentucky after they had come to Arizona. And um, we did. And I met everyone. He gave this big party for the whole town and all my cousins and great cousins and aunts and uncles That's and my grandfather. That's a very Kentucky grandfather. thing to do. <laughs> well, but it was wonderful, uh-huh. you know, and uh-huh. everybody knew I was his daughter, but uh-huh. I was adopted and I had other parents and it was no secret. So, so it was kind of a, this is your family type thing, right? You yeah. got to meet all of the people that you would have never got to meet. Yeah. Nice. And, and and that was great. Uh, mm-hmm. We had so much fun. Mm-hmm. I mean, oh, that's a fun family down mm-hmm. there. <laughs> and, <laughs> a little different than I, uh-huh. you know, than how I grew up. But that's okay. You know, they're they're really honest and open. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, so and uh, that that was great. And it was great that there was no secret. You mm-hmm. know, with my birth mother, I had to be always really careful because I could never say. That is my mother. Mm-hmm. Um, but with my birth father's family, I could say. And everybody knows, and everybody who meets him gets told that he has a daughter from Germany. Nice. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to wrap things up with Yulia Myers, author of the book Coffee and Cake, an Adoptee in Search of Her Past. Okay, so now I better look for something to
dance with me. Dance with me. Let's play Jeopardy. What? Jeopardy. Okay. okay. The answer is E I E I O. E I E I O. <laughs> okay. What is the question? Name the International Farm Animals Union. <laughs> <laughs> You're watching Red Dragon TV, an internet station devoted to the finest in independent entertainment. We feature indie artists of all kinds from around the world. You can be part of the effort. Just click the donate button on the RDTV website and make a contribution to help keep Red Dragon TV on the air. You'll be helping to maintain a format to give exposure to all kinds of independent artists and to keep RDTV's fine programs going strong. Programs like In La Gata De Vida, Escape to Music, The Wednesday Open Mic, Friday Night Variety Show, The Andina Rich Comedy Hour, and our 24-7 stream of music, poetry, novelty, and surprises. The big music corporations don't own show business anymore. Help keep it that way by supporting Red Dragon TV. Just click the donate button on the website and contribute whatever you can. And thank you for supporting independent entertainment on Red Dragon TV. You're watching Red Dragon TV. Yeah, I know. I'm a green dragon. I'm a temp. Deal with it. And we're back on Inagata De Vida here on RedDragonTV.tv. Marty, could you turn that camera just a little bit? It's a little slightly off center. There we go. That's been bugging me all night. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that funny how you have one little thing that can just make the back really? of your mind go off all the time. <laughs> see, for me, I, I see myself on the TV there, so uh -huh. I don't know where to look. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> so if yeah. I look up there, then... Did yeah. you ever think you could see yourself, you would see yourself on a TV? No, not <laughs> at the same time I'm talking. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty cool, isn't it? <laughs> I remember my first experience with WYLU, the local community television, yeah. and seeing myself on TV <laughs> and thinking and, and getting really emotional in the process because it's like, oh, wow, that's me, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, you wouldn't think that that would be an emotional process, but it really is. And um, we're talking with Julia Myers, author of the book Coffee and Cake, uh, an adoptee in search of her past is uh, the uh, title of the book and theme of the book. And uh, what do you have for us next that you want to read? Well, I, this time I thought about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I actually, I have a little story I haven't read at any 
uh, talks I have given so far, but it was a very interesting plane trip I took, and it has to do with adoption. And I took that plane trip when um, Sean was five months old. Sean is my second son, who is nine now. And uh, actually, the it was a sad event. My aunt and uncle in California had died, and um, my mother and my aunts came to California, and I wanted to go and be there too. And we lived in Tucson, so the plane trip was supposed to be 90 minutes. And here it goes. Um, so I boarded the plane, and it left right on time. A woman, a little younger than me, sat next to me. She had blonde, shoulder-long hair and a nice smile. She seemed not to mind Sean. Behind us, though, sat a woman who was obviously annoyed by having a baby so close to her. Well, it would only be a 90 minutes, and I was there. Sean cried a little when we took off, and the woman behind us recommended giving him Benadryl to calm him down. I am not giving a baby Benadryl for any reason. I mean, not for that reason. I was a little upset, but the nice woman next to me comforted me. She seemed to be really taken by Sean, and we started talking. Soon we were approaching Modesto, when things started to change. There was a thick fog, and the pilot informed us that this moment, that at this moment it was impossible to land. We would be circling around for a while to see if the weather would allow the landing. The short circling turned into an hour and then two. Sean was hungry, and so was I. There was no, f there was no food on the short flight like this. But I was nursing and started feeling quite hungry. Fortunately, for Sean. I was nursing him. I also started getting worried about diapers since I had only packed two on the carry-on. The rest were in the suitcase case, which was not accessible to me. A couple sitting a few rows back suddenly came to me and asked if I wanted a banana that the woman had in her purse. She saw me nursing and knew I needed food to keep the milk supply ready. I accepted gratefully. Sean was incredibly quiet, considering he was in this tiny space with loud noises of the engines. My neighbor and I warmed up to each other, and I somehow mentioned that I was adopted and recently found my birth mother. Something changed in Amy when she heard me say this, and she shared that several years prior, she had placed for adoption her five-month-old baby girl. The baby was the same age as Sean was was now. I felt a deep empathy for this young woman. She told me she missed her baby very much, but she was using trucks at the time and living in a cold, abandoned house. One day, when the baby was five months old, she suddenly had an awakening moment, realizing she could not raise a baby like this, so she placed her for adoption. It was an open adoption, and she would visit the little girl sometimes, being introduced as a distant relative. My heart opened for this woman. I told her about my birth mother and her pain of giving me away since she had no partner and no paying job and she was helpless. She wanted me to have a good, safe home with a father and a mother. When I met her seven years earlier, being already 29 years old, she told me that there had not even been a single day without thinking about me. Even so, she had married and had three more daughters. Oh, how I could feel for Amy who had just done what she knew was best for the baby, but how much she missed her. The plane suddenly sped up. Its nose went up and we sped away. The fuel was running out and we had to fly to Oakland to land. The plane just made it. There we stood in the middle of the runway and had to be picked up by buses because the plane was out of fuel. Now a whole airplane full of people was waiting at the Oakland airport where nobody wanted to be. We waited for two, hour, two more hours until the airline sent three big buses to bring us all to Modesto Airport by road. Waiting at the airport, all the people in the plane started to talk to each other. Magically, probably because we were, after all, in the same boat, all anger and frustration subsided. <clears throat> the woman who in the beginning complained about Sean Sean told me now that what a good baby he had been. Other people were exchanging phone numbers and cell phones to call their loved ones and to tell them they were fine, just late. People I had never seen before helped me get food and diapers. Amy and I took the same bus, as did the lady whose 
who would still sit behind us. Stories circled about what people had planned to do that day. One woman missed her father's funeral, another the first day of an important conference. But somehow, this no longer seemed important. The whole airplane crowd became like a family. It was a most happy crowd. I called my cousin, who was still waiting at the airport, telling him when I would arrive. When we passed the Golden Gate Bridge, the fog started to lift. The sun was setting, and I could see the Golden Gate Bridge and the Oakland Bay Bridge both together in the red-orange fog. It was the most amazing sight I have ever seen. I always carry a camera, but just then I could not find it in my big diaper bag. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the image will be in my heart forever now, though. We finally get to the airport in Modesto at 11 p.m. after a nine-hour trip, what would have been only a 90-minute flight. Everybody said goodbye. The lady behind us, whose name I never knew, looked at me and Amy standing together, not knowing exactly what to do or say. Now, would you just give each other a hug? We did. We exchanged addresses and parted. When I finally found my cousin and we were on our two-hour trip to Sonora, I started thinking about this trip. I had been upset and tired, and suddenly it occurred to me. I had done this trip and had spent all those hours in the airplane and the bus just to meet Amy. It was all about her. Amy had to meet me, had to see that giving away her child had been a good thing. She had to meet me to hear that she would be fine for me as an adopted child to tell her she did right. Someday she and her husband would have their own baby and she would be a wonderful mother. I was sure about this. Unfortunately, I lost her address and we never met again. But I know in my heart that, just like me, she will never forget those nine hours we spent together. The bond we felt as an adoptee and a mother who had given her child up for adoption. When she had held Sean, she must have known that everything was fine and that she would not feel guilty, but gratefulness that her child was given a chance for a better life. And you were reading from the book, Coffee and Cake, an adoptee in search of her past. Yulia Myers here with us tonight on Inagata de Vida. And um, yeah, the, the whole journey just seems to be an incredible one. I, I, I applaud you for um, staying strong and, <laughs> and probably sticking to your, your own virtues, your own power, and, and not letting that get taken away from you, because that was really well, important you. to you, too, Yeah, was not to lose yourself. <laughs> you know, we didn't talk about your brother very much. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> were you both adopted at the same time, or no? My brother is three years younger than me, mm -hmm. and um, as a result, I I actually knew where he was from. I mean, I um, at that time in Germany, a baby place for adoption had to go to an orphanage for three months uh -huh. and stay there, so the parents could still take you back. It was for the birth parents. Oh, and now, you know, later on, um, they changed the law and made it better for the child so that you could have, go to your family, right, you know, a day after you're born, just mm -hmm. like a, like your own child. Mm -hmm. um, but at that time, that's how it was. And then we had to be foster children for a year. So I was almost one and a half when mm -hmm. I was really adopted legally. Mm -hmm. And so, but that way, my brother, you know, we... My parents knew they wanted to adopt him, and we went to the orphanage to visit him. Mm -hmm. And I remember that. And I remember picking him up. And he was an infant? He was an infant, okay. yeah. He was mm -hmm. three months old. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was a really nice experience. And mm -hmm. I still, he had a blanket his parents had given him. Um, that's the only thing he has from his birth parents. And mm -hmm. actually, I have that here, and I used it for my children because... Um, I see him in this blanket. Mm -hmm. that, that's my memory. I mm -hmm. mean, I keep it for him, of course. You mm -hmm. know, it's 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 safe and clean. And mm -hmm. um, but I have this memory of him coming in this blanket. And were you two close? Did you <laughs> did you love each other? Get along? All of that stuff? I or? think it's like my kids, like Carmen mm -hmm. and Sean. You know, we 
as you know, being the older sister, I was a lot annoyed by him doing what I did. Uh-huh. So he had to play with dolls. You know, I dressed oh, him. <laughs> <laughs> I dressed him up as a princess. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> Car- Carmen did that with Sean too. Uh-huh. Uh, but you know. But other than that, yeah, we're... But, you know, like every sibling, I mean, we had our moments and Mm -hmm. we played together well, but we also fought and Mm -hmm. um, didn't like each other so much as teenagers. Mm -hmm. But, you know, now we really... And how did he feel about the process of you (laughs) reaching out to your mother? He was okay with it. And he, you know, he met my birth mother, he met my sisters, he met my birth mother's husband. Mm -hmm. And, um, but... He said, you know, uh, you're my sister, mm-hmm. and that's it. And he does not have any inclination to find his birth parents. I was going to ask you that. <laughs> I knew. Yeah, he, he just, he <laughs> really, he, he's very he, happy with his life. Yeah, he's happy, you know, he, that's his family. Yeah. And it's, not to say you were unhappy. No, you, because no. Because you weren't unhappy in this process but, at all. But, you know, it's, it's our characters, too. Like, mm-hmm. um, as you have realized, I have an aunt and uncle lived in California that was the funeral I was going to Mm -hmm. and uh, I have other relatives in Canada and those are from my adopted family so I have family all over the world Mm -hmm. always had and I was always the one bringing them together I was the one going there when I was 16 and my mother and her sister hadn't seen each other in 15 years Mm -hmm. I was the one who brought them actually together after 30 years Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. I was the one finding relatives in Canada and bringing them back to Germany and mm-hmm. create a family party. So I'm always the family person. I mm-hmm. like to create family parties. I like to get the family together. Mm-hmm. So that's my character. Okay. And so it's, it's a little different. And my brother, so it fit. That's, the journey that's fit so you. his thing. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. We're going to go to a video and we'll be right back. And we'll just have a couple of minutes left. To Midnight in Montgomery, the over eagle, lonely road. I was on my way to Mobile for a big New Year's Eve show. Stopped just a minute to see a friend outside of town. Put my collar up, I found his name, and felt the wind die down in a drunk man. Cowboy, he took me by surprise, wearing shiny boots and a nudie suit and hauling on high. He said, Friend, it's good to see you, it's nice to know he cared. And the wind picked up and he was gone. Was he ever really there? Cause it's midnight. Just here at Whippoorwill, see the stars light up the purple sky, and feel that lonesome chill. But when the wind is right, you'll hear his song, smell whiskey in the air. Midnight. He's always singing there. Well, I climbed back on that eagle, took one last look around at the red tail light. Shadow moving slow across the ground. And all somewhere, midnight train slowly passes by. I could hear that whistle moaning. I'm so lonesome I could cry. Cause it's midnight in Montgomery. Just here. That whippoorwill See the stars 
stars light up the purple sky and feel that lonesome chill. When the wind is right, you'll hear his song, smell whiskey in the air. Midnight in Montgomery, he's always singing there. Always singing there. He's always singing there. And we're back. I'm Ari John White Wolf. You've been watching Intergada de Vida on RedDragonTV.tv, and our guest tonight was Yulia Myers, who uh, wrote Coffee and Cake, an adoptee in search of her past. And uh, Yulia, thank you so much for coming on the program tonight. And I know I've been trying to get you on for a <laughs> while now, and uh, very grateful that you could come and be a part of Red Dragon TV. And, yeah, thank you, know, you for inviting me. You're I always welcome back anytime you want to come back. Just say, hey, I want to come back on, and we'll put you on. Thank and, you. Uh, and uh, thank you very much, everyone. Have a good night. We'll talk to you real soon. I always look at him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a green dragon. I'm a temp. Deal with it. <laughs>